We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I think we still have some folks joining, but we have a quorum to, to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, my name is Megan Roberts. I'm Director of Policy Planning at the United Nations Foundation. And I'm really just thrilled to be here today to moderate this conversation uh, on corporate action on digital inclusion, progress and prospects. Before I go any further, I just wanna make sure you all can hear me. Is there competing sound? All good, okay. Okay. We can hear you and see you, Megan. Greetings from Poland. Thank you so much, Nana, and for the other confirmations on the line. Really appreciate that. Um, our conversation today is co-hosted by the World Benchmarking Alliance and the United Nations Foundation. UNF is a really proud partner of the WBA, and we know its work is just transformative for achieving the sustainable development goals. And we're here today to discuss how government, civil society, international organizations, companies, investors, how we can all work together to leverage the 2021 findings of the digital inclusion benchmark to accelerate and to really drive inclusive digital transformation, which will be key for achieving the SDGs. And as you all know, this work is incredibly timely. We're meeting at the Internet Governance Forum, the second to take place during the COVID-19 pandemic only underscoring that meaningful participation in economic, social, political, policy life requires being online. New data from the ITU shows a really a mixed picture on how we're doing on digital inclusion. Incredibly, over the last two years, nearly 800 million people went online for the first time. The ITU calls this a COVID connectivity boost, and it's incredible. But the ITU data also shows that still nearly 3 billion people have never used the internet, and the number is far larger if we're talking about meaningful, consistent, affordable internet access. And the ITU data also details meaningful gaps in the digital divide across geography, gender, and, and generations. A central commitment of the Sustainable Development Goals is to leave no one behind. And these are exactly the people who are at risk of being left behind. And of course, once people do get online, they need the skills to navigate the digital world and they face important threats to their rights and their safety online. So we need to think about digital, digital inclusion in a really holistic way. It's not just about getting online once, it's about consistent and affordable access. It's having the skills to navigate the digital world. It's arriving to an online world characterized by trust and by safety. And this is exactly the type of global challenge and really incredible global opportunity that requires um, action and leadership from stakeholder from all stakeholders and sectors. So I want to encourage all of our speakers and our participants today to really focus on how we can work together using the incredible resource of the digital inclusion benchmark to make progress and even think about what we can do over the next 12 months. You know, what can we achieve together? How can we be really ambitious? And who else do we need to, to bring along? Luckily, we have an absolutely incredible lineup of speakers and panelists that will explore these issues in our conversation today. Before I introduce our first speaker, I wanna share just a few quick housekeeping notes. Our event today is on the record, it's being recorded and it will be posted online afterwards. Uh, please be sure to stay muted when you're not speaking, but we do really wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your reactions, your questions, your thoughts on how you'll be using the benchmark and how we can all be working together to achieve transformative change. So please use the chat box to ask any questions of the digital benchmark team or to share your thoughts on how the benchmark uh, can be used in your own work and, and for others. Please also join uh, the conversation on social media using the hashtags that you should see um, in the chat already. Um, and just quickly on how we'll use our hour together. We'll soon hear a presentation on the findings of the 2021 digital inclusion benchmark. And we'll then have two panel sessions. The first focused on multi-stakeholder collaboration for digital inclusion. And the second will focus on private sector action. 
So we have a lot to cover into 60 minutes. I'm going to try to keep us all to time and we'll be ready to enforce time limits where needed. So panels, please consider yourself warned. Uh, okay, with the housekeeping out of the way, I am absolutely delighted to introduce Lourdes Montenegro. Lourdes is the lead of digital sector transformation at the World Benchmarking Alliance, and she's going to share with us the findings from the 2021 Digital Inclusion Benchmark. Lourdes, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Megan, for that wonderfully warm welcome. Um, we are very excited to be here today at the UN Internet Governance Forum 2021. I think it's 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 really right that we are we are at the IGF to launch the second round of results for the digital inclusion benchmark with the theme of the IGF being Internet United. So we are happy to be here with various stakeholders from private sector, government, civil society, investors um, working together in a united way towards an inclusive and trustworthy digital transformation. So, so very excited. Um, to get us started, let me try to share my screen first. So um, to get us started, I would like to, to, to begin with a reflection on the UN Secretary General's um, opening speech yesterday for the Internet Governance Forum. It was actually a, a very uh, succinct and, 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 and very touching um, um, message to all of us working together on these issues. Um, he, in his speech, he reflected on the, the speed, you know, the, 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 that digital technologies are shaping history, shaping the future. But he asked very three very crucial questions. Um, one was, will our societies become more equal or less equal? Um, will our dignity and rights be enhanced or diminished? Um, will we become more or less secure and safe? And, and he worried in his speech that invention is outpacing policy setting, resulting in a governance gap. Um, the, the governance gap is worrying because we, you know, as, as Megan has mentioned, we are undertaking digitalization at breakneck speed. While it's good news that more and more of the world is um, coming online, latest figures say 63% now of all individuals are using the internet. Um, there are also risks and there are also things that we need to think about in, in how we want to shape that kind of transformation. So that's why we're here today. Um, our role as an organization is to provide that accountability mechanism um, to ensure that the private sector um, is uh, accountable for its actions, that we have visibility, we have transparency over what the private sector is doing because the private sector, of course, are key actors towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So what we do at the WBA the World Benchmarking Alliance, we're a global initiative, we have allies all over the world uh, from, from, from different, um, different parts of society, from investors to multilateral organizations. And we provide the data freely and publicly on how companies are doing towards the sustainable development goals, especially in terms of actions that are closest to their core business, what we call the seven system transformations. So what I will, I will talk about uh, briefly, shortly, um, is really to provide everyone here with a tool. So what we wanna do is equip everyone with the tools, the knowledge, the information and data to think about where the gaps are, to look at where advocacy should be, where policy should be, which part of the world are, are we missing, which, which sectors, which industries still need to be encouraged to do more and to do better. So the digital inclusion benchmark is really a race to the top for inclusive and trustworthy digital transformation. Th that is what it is. It evaluates company performance across four interrelated areas, um, enhancing universal access to digital technologies, improving all levels of digital skills, fostering trustworthy use by mitigating risks and harms, and ensuring open, inclusive, and ethical innovation. We cover, we assess 
150 companies for this year. Uh, the number will grow to 200 companies by 2023. These companies are across the whole um, digital ecosystem, the digital sector value chain, from hardware, from semiconductors, to telecommunication services, to IT software, uh, uh, IT services and software. And most of these companies will be familiar to all of you. They include all the big names, as well as the not so big names that are operating in key national and regional um, areas where we need to see improvements across the digital divide. So these companies obviously have a global reach. They cover the, the entire world. Um, there are, of course, some continents and regions where we see less of them. And that's because there really are less of them. And, and, and we will see that this, um, the private sector is quite concentrated in the global north. And that's part of our mission. We hope that uh, this will not be the picture um, in the future that we will see more representation across various uh, countries, especially in the global south. The, before I go on to tell you the good news, so let's start with the bad news first. Uh, bad news and then good news. So the bad news is that um, we found in our latest, um, in the latest round this year in 2021, that industry, the digital sector really still has a long way to go, really a long way to go. Um, the top company, and, and I, I'm very happy to congratulate um, Telefonica, who is number one in this benchmark this year, are well ahead out of, uh, well ahead of all the 150 companies. The, the lead is very large, but there are very few companies like that. A very few who are really leading the sector. In fact, only over two dozen companies show uh, really, if we call it passing marks 50%, then really that's, that's only um, 27 companies. And the vast majority are below 50%. So while there is, um, uh, some improvement in comparable scores from last year's benchmark, progress is still too slow. Because why do we say progress is too slow? Because we know that the motto in this industry is to move fast, and therefore they're not moving fast enough on issues that matter to human societies, to, to people everywhere. So, so, so we need to take note that as a whole, we have our work cut out for us. The, the other um, alarming finding, alarming and chilling and, and, and many other adjectives is that what we're seeing from the research is um, the sector is extremely enthusiastic about AI benefits. And we read that on every company disclosure, every company report, how wonderful, what are the potential benefits? But what's missing is a concern over the risk. So that is what is scary. We found that only 19 of the 150 companies that were being benchmarked this year commit to publicly available ethical principles. So that's, um, that's a very small number for a very huge group of companies. And that's particularly alarming because that means that we are driving into a future where people will have less agency face job loss, or we will exacerbate all the existing biases, this, this discriminatory biases in society. So again, once again, we have a work cut out for us. Another um, uh, uh, issue, big issue that we found is that, and, and that's actually what's unique about this benchmark, because we also look at the company's positive contributions. We look at what they're doing to bring digital technology access to vulnerable groups, improving digital skills, um, making sure women and girls are digitally included, the disabled people in rural areas, et cetera. And, and we see that companies are extremely proud of their initiatives uh, from discounted services to vulnerable groups and digital skills training. Unfortunately, many of these are one-off and uh, one-off interventions. Um, just 8% of companies publish an impact assessment for one or more of their initiatives. So it's 
a very few number of companies who actually go out there, look at their initiatives and say, who are the beneficiaries? Did this actually improve their lives? Did, did, did what we do in our Tech for Good initiatives actually uh, have any positive impact on society? So very few actually have something that looks at the impact of their own initiatives, which raises the question really on how good these initiatives are and if these are just a form of impact washing. So we really need to look into the quality of these tech for good initiatives to encourage companies to do better um, because they are capable of doing better. As, as we always say, the Spider-Man quote, with more power comes more responsibility. Um, for the fourth key finding, you know, that we found this year, and I'm pretty sure none of you will be surprised. Um, everyone knows this, but it just it is just confirmed by the data very clearly that we still need more women in tech. Um, the good news is that more companies disclosed this information compared to last year, and 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 we found that as a win. And in fact, a lot of the increase comes from companies headquartered in Korea, in the Republic of Korea and Japan. So there's an increasing um, attention towards gender um, involvement in technical roles, at least in East Asia, and that's great. But still, only just one third of companies report how many women they employ in tech roles. This means women in research and development, doing coding, doing engineering. And among the companies who are reporting, on average, 77% of tech roles are still held by men. So again, uh, we still have our work cut out for us. And then finally, this is, this is the big shocker, um, a big bombshell, I would say. Uh, we found, so when we did, and, and I will say later, uh, I will speak about the core social assessment very briefly in a short while, the industry still needs to pay attention to its human rights risks and impacts. And we all know all the big headlines uh, since last year, since, since a few years ago, from online hate speech that really has implications on, on genocide uh, to children, uh, child labor uh, in mining materials for smartphones. These are very serious, uh, serious issues that the sector, many companies in the sector have faced. So we can really say tech companies have a devastating impact on human rights. Yet, yet, only 15 of the 150 companies in the benchmark disclose that they have the very basic, very minimum requirements for what is called human rights due diligence as outlined in the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. These are processes to identify, assess, and integrate human rights risks and impacts in their business practices. So this, this, these are very few uh, companies once again. So that's the bad news. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the good news later on. There's also good news, so, so we don't have to be depressed. But just getting the juices flowing so that we can think about action and what we can do to improve this situation. So this year, what we did was we also assessed companies on what we call the core social indicators. So this is part of the World Benchmarking Alliance's commitment to assess all the 2,000 companies in its benchmarking universe called the SDG 2000 on three things, three social expectations, acting ethically, respecting human rights, and providing and promoting uh, decent work. Uh, these are just very basic expectations that society believes, you know, many, many stakeholders believe companies at least should be committed towards or should do something about. And, but this year, this assessment is not yet included in the ranking and score for the digital inclusion benchmark. However, we publish the, the text of this assessment in the company scorecard. And that's where we got the data, the human rights risk assessment. So we hope that that's a wake up call for many companies in the industry. And, and, and the results, of course, from that assessment are also quite interesting. We see 
differences by industry and differences by geography. So by industry, we see hardware companies leading, and that might be surprising to many, but hardware companies have been exposed to a lot of supply chain issues, which has led them to take their human rights due diligence processes a lot more seriously. So they lead the industry on, 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 on many of the core social issues from acting ethically to um, improving, um, promoting decent work, and especially on human rights. Geographically, we also see um, uh, a vast disparity, which can also be reflective of different uh, policy and market environments. And finally, the good news, <laughs> there is also good news, not just bad news, there are actually companies who take their responsibility towards digital inclusion pretty seriously. And, 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 and we see this in the benchmark. We see our, the top 15 companies, which I'm very happy to congratulate, um, especially Telefonica. Um, then we have Orange, Telstra, Apple, Cisco, Samsung, Alphabet, Deutsche Telekom, HP, Microsoft, Telia, PLDT, Verizon, Vodafone, and, and Intel. It's a long list. Um, but, but we see, and, 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 and there are also differences by industry. So a lot of the telecommunications companies, of course, um, have a longer history thinking about digital inclusion and considering it as an important and core part of their business. And uh, then we have the hardware companies, um, the IT and software service companies, the, our, our famous platforms, big tech, e-commerce, gig economy platforms, they're way behind. And they're still, if we think about them in terms of digital inclusion, they are teenagers. They still need to grow up uh, and mature. Uh, by region, we also see differences um, in geography. But, you know, the good news is that the companies who are actually headquartered in areas of the world where we see huge digital divides like in, in, in the African continent. The companies who are in, 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 in these areas, actually, they are doing very well in the benchmark, which means that I, I would interpret as being just close to the ground, close to the community, understanding the issues, and therefore considering it to be very important. So I, that's, that's, that's the, the silver lining in the uh, in the cloud, I would say. Um, another thing is that we've also seen a lot of companies improve this year. And one of the companies who have shown a lot of improvement is here with us uh, today to share on their experiences, that's NAS first. I would also congratulate them, first of all, for embracing and, and beginning this journey towards digital inclusion. So that's, that's a very important first step. Of the 150 companies in the benchmark, more than 50% have been seriously participating and engaging in the benchmarking process. So for me, whatever your score, if you engage, you're already taking the first step. And that's what's uh, very important. So we will also share a list of who these engaged and non-engaged companies are and, may, and make that public so that all stakeholders will know which companies are not paying attention to digital inclusion and, and who are paying attention. So please uh, feel free to share uh, the findings. You can go to the website, it's online, um, all the rank, the score, you can download the, the Excel spreadsheets. If you want more um, detailed data or uh, you want to co-publish um, um, thought leadership articles, research pieces, just let us know, um, help us amplify. And again, we hope to work together with all of you to ensure that we can progress on these uh, key issues we found in this year's digital inclusion benchmark. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lourdes. Really appreciate that, that whirlwind tour of, of this incredibly important work. Congratulations on the second iteration of the benchmark. It's really helpful to see both, you know, both the good news and, and, and the bad news um, and, and digging into some of that data and, and building on some of the findings that, that Lourdes has shared with us. I'm now gonna turn to our first esteemed panel that's focused on um, 
multi-stakeholder action for, for digital inclusion. Allow me to quickly introduce our speakers. They all have very impressive bios that you should have received with the event invitation and that um, I think we'll be putting in the chat, but because of our tight timeline today, I'll introduce them in their current roles. Um, so we're joined today by, I believe we're joined today by Philippe Andre Rodriguez, who's deputy director of the Center for International Digital Policy at Global Affairs Canada. But Philippe, I just wanted to see if you're um, in the room or if um, to check if you're online. We may still be waiting for, for Philippe to join us. Um, but we're also joined by Yuping Chen, Senior Program Officer in the United Nations Envoy, Office of the Envoy on Technology. Um, and last but certainly, certainly not least, Nena Wakunmad. Nena is the Chief Web Advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to um, engage each of you with with a question, and I think we'll you know, we'll start with um, we'll start with you, Ping, um, and then we can come back to Philippe um, if he's able to if he's able to join. Uh, you, Ping, you know your your um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, your you you personally and your office are working you know regularly across sectors on some of these very questions on on digital inclusion with stakeholders you know, ac across the gamut, looking at these key findings from the digital inclusion benchmark, how can multi-stakeholder actors collaborate with the United Nations to address these issues and to, to really advance digital inclusion? Thank you so much, Megan. And really yes. my congratulations to the World Benchmarking Alliance for an amazing report. We've been so proud to have had the World Benchmarking Alliance as part of our partners in the work that you just mentioned to implement the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, which has all these elements of inclusion, connectivity, and in some ways responsibility by tech companies for their policies and what they actually do to promote better use of technology. So in some ways, we've been very gratified by the fact that the World Benchmarking Alliance is really putting forward a tool that can measure progress being made by tech companies towards digital inclusion. And we really see this as a hallmark of the multi-stakeholder community calling big players in the digital sphere to account. In terms of how we can actually further this type of collaboration, I think there are two areas where, you know, I, I raise this for consideration of stakeholders as well as the World Benchmarking Alliance to take this work even further. Firstly, in the digital cooperation roadmap for which digital inclusion is a priority, we are really fundamentally looking at Firstly, establishing a universal definition for digital inclusion. And that's an area of work that I think Philippe and um, uh, that Philippe will actually come back and talk a little bit about as Canada is the chair of the, the round table on digital inclusion that was part of the process of following on the Secretary General's roadmap. And we really do think that this area of work actually will be very important in terms of how the international community defines digital inclusion, which can then be the basis of taking this work even further. And from the United Nations perspective, particularly importantly in terms of supporting countries in actually promoting digital inclusion. So even though the bench, the index and the benchmark is for companies, though area in which it can actually also resonate with national policies and what countries are doing in their own national spheres domestically and in their governmental policies, I think will be very important. The roadmap, for instance, puts out the idea of having scorecards that will help countries measure their progress towards digital inclusion. And I do think a lot of the themes that are in the benchmark itself will be resonant there. So I think, especially as we look forward to the future, this area of national support to countries could be potentially a way that stakeholders and the World Benchmarking Alliance could continue to collaborate with the United Nations. The other area that I want to mention is also the proposal by the Secretary General in his recent Common Agenda report for a global digital compact, which is a coming together of not just governments, but also private sector tech companies, as well as civil society around the digital future that we want, a more open, free, and secure digital future for all. And I emphasize for all because that's precisely the point of inclusion, that cannot be leaving out segments of society, individual groups, but it truly is for everyone. And that's why digital inclusion is so fundamental to this vision of the Secretary General and the United Nations that we're working to achieve. So here again, perhaps the World Benchmarking Alliance's work here and the benchmark itself could point our way towards holding digital tech companies accountable for their practices and that we could generalize some principles of digital inclusion that could be used to really hold the international community to account for this very important area of work. We could also think about the fact that this benchmark and how we measure progress over time could be a means of holding tech companies accountable. So again, 
I think the digital compact is an opportunity not just to see what governance should be doing, but also what the private sector should be doing. And in this area of digital inclusion, I see the benchmark as very important that, in this way as well. So for instance, I think Lotus has actually already laid out very clear recommendations based on the findings of this year's report. So this idea of available ethical principles for AI, the need for impact assessments of projects so that they're sustainable in the long term, that particularly in the area of human rights risks and assessments, there needs to be some kind of concrete process in place. And finally, this one I particularly am fond of, the percentage of women engaged in technical roles. Could there be, for instance, a specific percentage that technology companies are asked to commit to, and then we measure their progress against that specific commitment year by year? So these are some ideas, I think, for how the stakeholder community can come together to promote digital inclusion and to use the benchmark as a very important tool in this work forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuping. I love your thoughts on, you know, kind of the wider resonance of a lot of the elements of the benchmark and how these speak, you know, in, um, you know, for, for private sector, but even a broader set of stakeholders and for identifying some of those really specific areas that, um, you know, a, a wide set of stakeholders can be working together um, to really advance digital inclusion and a, and a positive, um, positive digital future. Um, it also sets us up perfectly for for me to turn to to our um, to our next speaker, um, and then I'd love to to turn to you for your perspectives on you know the role of civil society, but also knowing you know your deep knowledge of kind of the the actors, the players, the dynamics on on questions of digital cooperation. Um, so I'm really eager to hear your thoughts, um, and we'll ask you just specifically how can civil society actors such as the Web Foundation address issues that are highlighted in the digital inclusion benchmark findings? How can they use the benchmark to advance digital inclusion? And interested if you have any reactions to some of the specific ideas that, that you ping raised. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everyone. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet and it's wonderful to be here. Um, so to those online, thank you for coming. I know you've kept up. Um, so the World Wide Web Foundation is that organization founded by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. And the vision of the World Wide Web itself is that it will be technology that is available, accessible, affordable, and inclusive of everyone. So if you forget everything I've said today, remember these two words, for everyone. And the other word is for good. So those are the two main things captured by, by, the, by the report. How is it inclusive and how is it ethical? So for good and for everyone. The policy tool that summarizes that is called the Contract for the Web, which was launched about three years ago. And it is of no surprise to us that Telefonica is the golden winner. Congratulations to Telefonica, because Telefonica was one of the earliest companies that signed up to the contract for the web. I've sent out a tweet to congratulate you on behalf of myself, my organization, and my board. Now, coming to the question, what can we as Web Foundation and other organizations that are not aligned to government or, or industry uh, do? The first thing we want to do is to keep raising evidence. That's exactly what the Alliance is doing, like us. Ask the questions, give or share the data, speak about them. That's my role. My, I, I'm an advocate for a reason. And, and people don't like me, but I'll keep speaking until I lose my voice. But I train my voice so I don't lose it. So you keep hearing from me, you keep seeing tweets from us. So the first thing we have to do is raise evidence uh, share the, the data, keep speaking about them, uh, keep raising dust until everyone who should hear us will hear us. On scorecards, um, we've, al we've always been providing scorecards, uh, especially in the gender digital data divide. That's very clear because inclusion today, when we talk about for everyone, our research shows that more men are online, 21% uh, more men uh, go, are going online. And so this, this is the thing, we need to keep 
shedding light where we don't have light. So it is very easy to say, half the world is it's connected, but no, we want to go deeper down. We want to know who is out there. We were talking about leaving no one behind. We want to bring in detailed data. That's one thing we can do. And the Web Foundation has been doing that through our Women's Rights Online Network. We do publish uh, the, the gender digital scorecard. And I'm happy to get in contact with anyone who wants to see deeper into this. Um, now, since you being my good friend is here, she, we are friends when we are far, but when, when we are near, we know we are not friends because I keep giving her trouble. We work with the Office of the UN Tech Envoy on at least three things. The first is on global connectivity because we need to describe what it means to be connected. It is not enough to say someone is in coverage area. It is not enough to say someone has a phone. It is very important that we have meaningful connectivity. Meaningful connectivity is what allows me to do what I'm doing with you, connect, have the right device, be connected every day, have the right speed, have the right connection. So it is not enough to say connectivity. It is enough to say meaningful, affordable, connectivity. And that's one of the things we are leading as the World Wide Web Foundation. You being talked about um, the Global Digital Compact. One role we have always played in the spirit of for everyone is that the other half of the global population that is not connected needs to be heard, needs their experiences to be understood so that when organizations Orange Telefonica, I see you listed them, are uh, having their policies made, they will think and understand how best to be inclusive. So what we want to do in the Global Digital Compact is yes, give trouble to the Office of the UN Tech Envoy. Yes, give trouble to the, office, the Executive Office of the Secretary General himself, but take trouble up to the UN General Assembly itself, including its presidency, by knocking on the door and saying that internet access should be a basic human right. But then we want to go further. We want to make voices heard, especially voices from the Global South voices from Tanzania, voices from Sudan, voices from Egypt, voices from Jordan, voices from Bangladesh. We want to make vo voices of soccer fans, voices of the, the blind, voices of students, voices of uh, 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 people who are physically challenged. We want to make all of these voices heard. It is not enough to sit in Poland, be nicely connected and make great speeches. It is enough that it is for everyone, that it is for good. And when Tim Bernersley says for everyone, I think that's where the UN got it and said, leave no one behind. I'll stop there. None no, of that is fabulous. And I think if we can keep, keep that spirit of for everyone and for good, even if that means making a little trouble along the way, I, I think if we really embrace that spirit, that would be incredibly you know, incredibly powerful. I do just want to check again if um, if Philippe is either joining us virtually or perhaps he's in in the room. So just give us a second for that. <clears throat> just make sure we aren't inadvertently skipping him. Um, all right, all right. It looks like he he might he may have had some trouble may have had some trouble joining us. Um, I want to thank our, our two fantastic panelists. I want to encourage all of our participants to really make use of the, of the chat function here because we can keep this conversation going. I think they both brought you know, so many uh, concrete and specific and inspiring and you know, challenging ideas for, for all of us to be, um, to be working toward. Um, so thank you so much. I could ask you so many more questions, but our time is, is quite tight, <laughs> quite tight today. Um, We've heard we've heard some great great thoughts from the civil society perspective, from you know the UN perspective. Um, it's now time to hear some insights from some of our private sector uh, private sector leaders on on digital inclusion. So I'm really delighted to introduce our our three panelists again without sharing their full and very impressive bios, which you should have received. But I'm so pleased to be joined today by Prajna Khanna, who's the head of sustainability at Process and Naspers. Eduardo Navarro, who's Chief Corporate Affairs and Sustainability Officer at Telefonica, 
And so pleased to be uh, to be joined by Christine Bruschka, who's head of um, who's the sustainability investing analyst at Fidelity International. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to first turn to you, Prajna. Prajna, Process and Naspers has registered some really impressive results in the 2021 Digital Inclusion Benchmark and important progress over the last over the last year. What approaches has your company taken to improve its efforts to advance digital inclusion? How has the digital inclusion benchmark helped your company in this journey? And what do you think your peers might be able to learn from, from your experience and your journey? Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, for those of us, those who on the uh, call who don't really know what NASPERS and Process are, we are a company from the Global South. We're one of the few actually South African companies that's registered in the Global North now at the Dutch Stock Exchange. And we're the, the world's, one of the world's largest technology investors and primarily in digital technology platforms. So digital inclusion to us is absolutely the core materiality to our business. We focus on financial solutions, fintech, so uh, and all of our investments are 90% plus of our investments are in the global south. So when we, are, uh, when we go in from a commercial perspective to uh, uncover new digital innovations, entrepreneurs who are striving for um, breaking barriers and really innovating for enablers for digital inclusion. Uh, that's where we step in with our, with our financial and non-financial resources. So it's incredibly material. It's uh, unfortunate, that, uh, but a positive outcome for us uh, because of the COVID situation, there's been a massive uh, growth um, hockey step growth in, across all the companies that we invest in from LATAM to China to uh, India and Southeast Asia. Uh, what's very critical to understand is that uh, there are several adjacencies underpinning digital inclusion. The first of them is access to universal access to energy as it is with, with all the SDGs. So there are a billion people in the world who do not have access to energy. What we have done structurally as a company is really understand what are the barriers that are keeping, let me give you a statistic out there. 16% uh, of Indian women use digital te technology platforms to meet their financial services needs. 26% of Indian men do the same. Now, that, the delta between the 1.3 billion people and the 16% of them actually, women actually using digital technology for financial inclusion, because that's a very clear, that's a, what is, is digital inclusion for the sake? And I love, uh, Nene, it was a pleasure to hear you and your passion. It's not just what digital inclusion enables the voice but it's far beyond, it's access to health, it's access to education in the way that people can receive and digest education where they are. It's a solution for climate change through digital technology apps that we're investing in, we're enabling farmers in, in, in across the world to uh, map the soil, understand the biome of their soil so they can plan for better and have better uh, supply chain behind uh, planning for them. With themselves, so it's not just digital inclusion for itself, but the uh, the end uh, enablement of multiple other developmental needs that we, from our perspective, are absolutely critical, including access to livelihoods, gender equity, uh, all of those. So I think that um, you know, for uh, to to your point, Lourdes, from before, I think the private sector has been you know innovation, and yes, you come up with it, and it's about not just digital inclusion, but responsible digital inclusion. And that's what we find very, very important for ourselves. Congratulations, Eduardo, to the Telefonica team. Um, I think one of the critical things for us has been this year to really understand how we can articulate the narrative better. Um, it is, uh, for us, it, it is very much in a commercial mindset. And I think that's where the inherent gap lies between the private sector and civil society organization and, uh, and the public sector. But phrasing the same in a way that uh, fits in with the, uh, with the way uh, you're expecting to hear that narrative as well, uh, because I don't think the private sector players such as us are not incognizant of the risks. The uh, It is risk to our business continuity. If there are uh, data breaches, if there is uh, uh, unethical AI use, it is reputational risk. It's it's very much, you know, they're a, a part of our uh, risk assessment, risk management. We have just not, uh, there is very often a gap between uh, articulating the way we map those risks and the solutions and whether it is the impact that we have through our digital inclusion, um, uh, through just our commercial activities in a way that fits in with the way that civil society organizations are uh, also viewing it. And, and I think that's critical. 
uh, for us. So uh, it's been a great learning curve this year to uh, try and bridge that gap through the through the process. And um, uh, yeah, on the you know energy access, we need to have there are a billion people uh, very very critically. If we would bring all the three billion people, how many were Ludis uh, who still need to be enabled access to digital platforms or digital inclusion in traditional ways, it would be devastating for the climate. So it's not just AI and uh, ethical, um, um, uh, responsible digital inclusion. It's about um, enabling energy access, which is decentralized systems and off grid, bringing people onto the grid, leapfrogging, leapfrogging from traditional ways of doing this. Uh, it's also digital uh, platforms enable for solutions for banking, for example. Traditional brick and mortar banking, if you had to bring the 1.7 billion unbanked people into the banking grid, in traditional brick and mortar ways and not use fintech solutions, it's going to be devastating for the climate. So it's 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 those adjacencies that one really has to capture. And that's what we're looking to better articulate for you going forward. Thank, thank you so much, Prashant. I really appreciate you, you bringing that you know, perspective and underscoring the importance and the foundational need for universal access to energy, our need to think about digital inclusion as an enabler for so many other development needs. It's really an accelerator across the whole sustainable development goal agenda and its relationship with climate. Um, so really appreciate you bringing, this is not, this is not simple. This is really complex, um, you know, set of, of, of questions that we need to, to be asking ourselves. Um, I'm now going to turn to, to you, Eduardo. First, you know, we've, we've heard your name. We've heard Telefonica throughout this this conversation. So just want to give you a big congratulations for, for uh, you know, achieving the top spot on the benchmark. Um, it's a wonderful uh, achievement. Looking at the findings, you know, Telefonica is among those, you know, not only at the, at the top spot, but really leading in best practices across the four measurement areas of the benchmark, access, skills, use, and innovation. What are you doing right? How, how do you think of this? Think about these issues as a company, and, and how can other other companies and peers learn learn from your experience? Hi, Megan. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where we are now. Each of us. First of all, in name of all the Telefonica team, I would like to thank you very, very much, you know, for your very kind words, you know, towards Telefonica. And I have to say that uh, it's a real honor for all of us at Telefonica that are especially working on this uh, to be recognized this year no, by the World Benchmark Alliance uh, mm -hmm. for our commitment to addressing digital inclusion. Uh, I see what to ask and what to read right. I think that uh, we, are, we are trying to do many uh, things right at the least. First of all, I think it's the most important thing. We have a great team and have a very committed uh, chairman, CEO, and board, and board members. I think that it's fundamental now in order to, to move in the direction that uh, we are trying to go. Uh, we have, a, but I think we very important, we listen and we learn. And we have a, learned a massive amount of information from the World Benchmark Alliance. Now, everything that we learn from you now, I think help us to, to, to to, to, to move and to try to be a little, you know, a little uh, best every day. But if I may, you know, I think we have an advantage uh, is that we have a real commitment to society and uh, one that goes back a long way. We in our company is going to, to accomplish our hundredth anniversary now in three years from now. And I'll say that in this centenary history, there is a strong commitment to topics like this. I'd say that uh, that uh, maybe this is uh, this is new when you talk about digitalization. But if you believe you now that it's uh, that's our mission is to approach people who have been doing this in different ways in the last uh, in the last uh, uh, 100 years, uh, digital digital inclusion or, or, or connecting people is part of our purpose. Our company's DNA. No, we have been defined our, our our mission as make our world more human by connecting lives. In the beginning, has been with fixed lines and have been with mobile lines. Then the internet. It depends. It's, it's independent of the technology. What we believe, it all has to be our mission here, is to 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 make a better world by trying to connect in lives. You know, it's it's a way to to promote more inclusive societies by bringing digitalization now. We are talking about digitalization, about 5G, but now, I don't know, in 20 years from now, 
can be a, a completely different technology, but for me, the purpose, the mission is, no, it's, it's, it's going to stay for a long time. During last, during last year, now in the, fact, in the face of the current health and, and social economic crisis, I think that our purpose has become even more relevant. Uh, we have learned that connectivity have, is, has been crucial uh, for an inclusive digitalization in the crisis. No, I think that you, from one day to the other, no, have learned how to work, how to learn, how to live our, no, we are for loved people uh, through the digital screen. But furthermore, we know that our work has great potential to, to contribute to the 2030 agenda. We always used to say, we like to say here that uh, we are not prob we are not part of the the, the, the green of the, the the climate problem. I think we are convinced that you are part of the solution. No, our sector as a general, and with all that are here with us. No, and uh, and I think that uh, no, that that's why you have to be incentive to be working on this. I think this is the reason why you view the purpose of us as this purpose as an opportunity more than ever. Our responsibility, more than responsibility. No, I think it's a privilege. We want to see a world where nobody uh, is, is going to, to left behind. I think this is this is clear. And we have defined our no, strategy around the sustainable development goals nine and one night, build a re resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Having said that, I think it's necessary to emphasize uh, that this is inclusive is an issue that goes beyond the development of infrastructure. We have learning by mistake in many cases that just going to a very, I would say, very poor area and just give a provide connectivity and provide uh, tablets no, to, to children, it's not enough. We have to go much more than this. Taxing the digital device requires a holistic approach with at least more pillars of infrastructure, accessibility, trust, and innovation. In terms of infrastructure, no, I think that the building better and sustainable infrastructure means bringing connectivity to everybody. I think that uh, you cannot take an excuse that uh, access to drinkable water, water, drinkable water, or to food, or to I'm the so food. sorry, Eduardo. Um, if I can just ask you to to wrap it up, quickly. I'm so sorry. Just give. Okay, us sorry, sorry. No, I just say that uh, for me, this infrastructure. No, uh, accessibility, no, that once we provide accessibility, that how we can, uh, no, how we can access, uh, access for free. Trust, for me, trust, for me, it's absolutely essential now in, in this uh, in this world of uh, fake news. No, that for me, it's to assure that uh, we can assure that different ways that uh, everything that you see in the digital world can be at trust. And finally, innovation. We see how we can permanently look before open innovation, no, in order to, you know, to help everybody have access to this. So yeah, I think in summary, I think that uh, we are very, very happy you know, for your recognition or for, you know, for this in the name of our Telefonica team. I have to say you know, that uh, it is in our DNA, it's in our purpose. And uh, what I can now assure you that this recognition just give us more incentives to, to, to move forward, you know, to, 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 to even to, to try to go faster. And, uh, and thank you, thank you very much, because everything that you listen and learn from you is uh, helping us to move fast. That's great, thank you so much, Eduardo. And I, I love that, the, the listening, the learning, the role of leadership, the understanding that this is this is a, a, a complex undertaking and it's really part of the, the purpose and the, and the mission of, of Telefonica. So thank you so much and, and congratulations again. I'm really excited to turn to, to Christine now to, um, Give us some perspective from the from the um, investor, you know, angle. We've heard how private sector, are, you know, companies are thinking about these issues, making these um, digital inclusion a priority. How can investors act on the benchmark findings to help drive systemic change and and to really drive digital inclusion? Oh, hey, thank you, Megan. Um, I also would quickly also like to congratulate Telefonica um, on their number one rating as an investor. I think I can see it's well earned. We get a lot of invitations to speak with Telefonica, learn more about what they're doing. And I'm really glad to see. And I think part of having the benchmark is to elevate companies that are working so hard and dedicating so much resource to these really important issues. I also very much want to acknowledge and thank the World Benchmarking Alliance because they've done amazing work on this benchmark. If you're not yet very familiar with it, it's worth digging into. 
Um, this is such an important topic of digital inclusion. So at Fidelity International, um, we are committed to incorporating sustainability across all areas of the business and our investment decisions. And one of the things that we're taking really seriously is this aspect of digital inclusion, which we think is not typically often considered you know, first at hand when you think about ESG. Um, but with the help of the WBA, we're really able to focus in on aspects within what we call digital ethics. It overlaps a lot with what the WBA has called um, digital inclusion, which is not, as you've heard, just about access inclusion, but everything from access through to skills, um, gender diversity, and even all the way through ethical AI. Um, so you asked specifically how investors um, can incorporate the benchmark findings. And I'd say we do this mainly through engagement. Um, we do this one-to-one -one when we meet with companies and we do it collaboratively with other investors. So I'll say a word about each of those and try to be quick because I know we're almost out of time. Um, but in terms of the one-to-one -one discussions, we've actually been using the benchmark findings since they were first released last year with the first 100 companies. So since then, when we have meetings with tech companies and we do our preparatory research, we're able to see what is this company doing well? What are they missing? And what can we ask them about? What can we say, hey, it's great. And it's nice to be able to acknowledge companies that are doing well and then also what we tend to do more is to say, here's something that you know, we as investors think you could do better and pay more attention to. So one-to-one, -one, we've been doing that already. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to say is that's really important, obviously, and any investor can do that. But I think it's also really important that we work in terms of driving systemic change to work collaboratively, particularly with other investors, but all stakeholders, because I think definitely the total will be greater than the sum of individual parts if we work on this together. And that's why this benchmark data is so helpful for us to have something to work with and take to companies as a collective effort. So you've probably heard about it a little bit in the past, and I think Lourdes will talk about it in the next couple of minutes, but we're really excited at Fidelity to be one of the lead investors on an upcoming collective engagement or collective impact coalition focused specifically on this um, really leading edge aspect of ethical AI. As you heard well from Lourdes, it's something that only 19 out of the 150 companies have publicly addressed. And it's really at least a very interesting conversations that we've been having already with companies, but we think we could actually have a lot of impact in a really important area pretty relatively early on before it gets like way out of control. So hopefully that's something that um, we'll hear more from Lourdes and I'm happy to speak more about in the future as well. Thank you so much, so much, Christine, and you you teed us up perfectly to to uh, discuss, you know, what are the opportunities of how we can take forward some of this momentum. So, Lord, as you know, we started out with you sharing some of the key findings. We have done the equivalent of digital expert speed dating over the last, you know, 35, 40 minutes. And my apologies to the speakers for um, needing everyone to, to be brief. But Lourdes, how, how can we how can we take this forward? Where where are we going next? And I know Christine mentioned the coalition, so eager to hear more about that. Um, thanks, Megan. So as we said, all this data is really just data unless we act on it. And the key is really in the SDGs itself, SDG 17, partnership and collaboration. As the UN Secretary General himself said yesterday, the answers to the questions on whether our rights will be enhanced, our societies will be more equal, or we become more safe or secure, depends on our ability to work together across all these you know, national political divides, across all different sectors from civil society and investors. So that's what we are aiming to do at the World Benchmarking Alliance, setting up an accountability mechanism on digital inclusion for the private sector involves not only the metrics, the publication of visibility on, on where companies are and how they're performing, but also all of us working together in coalitions um, across different divides globally so that we can act together to ensure that the private sector keep its eye on the price digital inclusion. Let's make sure that digitalization is indeed inclusive and trust, uh, trustworthy. It is our collective responsibility. So we invite everyone who is here listening, whether you're from civil society, whether you're from, gov you're from multilateral organizations, your investors, and, and, and together with, with the wonderful ideas from Yuping of the UN Tech Envoy's Office, 
extremely exciting on the upcoming digital compact and 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 we can weave together this work on different coalitions so that we can we can elevate um, the sector performance from from where it is now where we worry about where we're heading as humanity itself um, being led by technology or are we leading technology towards the betterment of our own lives so please get in touch with us um, uh, feel free email, email me email my colleagues uh, Nicholas over here our wonderful organizer I have to say thank you very much um, get in touch and um, next year let's 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 collaborate on actions that will really progress on many specific issues such as AI ethics. Um, we are now where climate was in the 1990s. Let's not get to the point where we it becomes irreversible. Let's let's act early. Uh, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Lourdes. And I want to underscore something that Nana said in the chat. This is for everyone. Um, and that we need to keep that in mind as we're building this inclusive digital future and as we're thinking about an inclusive digital transformation. This has been such a fantastic conversation. I, I really want to thank all of our speakers and, and experts today. You have offered such rich thoughts and, um, and I'm very excited about the momentum we have here and looking forward to working with the World Benchmarking Alliance and, and with all of you on um, the coalition and to really achieve some um, important progress over over the next year. Thanks so much to all of you for for joining us, and I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day, and rest of your IGF. Thank you very much for having us with you. Thanks, everyone. Stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.